Hey everyone, welcome to Professor Long's Lectures in Microbiology. I'm Professor Bob Long. Now these videos are intended for use by students who are enrolled in my courses at Del Mar College, uh, Microbiology for the Health Sciences. In no means is it intended for anyone else, but if you're out there in YouTube land and you find them helpful, please hit like and let me know. Um, please know that if you're taking this with someone else that you need to cover the material in the depth and breadth that that instructor wants you to learn the material. I may present it completely differently. I may not go into as much detail in this area or more detail in, in another, um, based on what I know is important for my students. I do have a clinical black background as well, so I know the application part of this material. This is why I enjoy teaching the micro for the health sciences. Now, um, finally, um, this is designed to provide a very broad, fundamental understanding of the basic concepts and principles in microbiology. Um, in some areas, I wish we had time to go into much greater detail, but we simply don't. If you do too much, people don't learn, get frustrated, and quit, and that is not my goal. Um, I'm also aware that you're going to continue to add levels of detail throughout your courses, so uh, I try not to teach it all in one spot. Uh, if you find that helpful, great. If you don't, my apologies, but oh well. So now, um, in this particular video, we're going to be going over what's called the innate immune system. Um, our innate defense response. So uh, when we talk about immunity, what we mean when we talk about immunity is um, our body's ability to resist or fight off disease and infectious agents, pathogens, exotoxins, things like that. Um, so our immunity or our immune system is simply that. It's our ability to fight off disease or infectious agents, okay? Um, the opposite of immunity is susceptibility. So this is the ability of our body to fight off or resist disease and infectious agents. I just use infectious agents as a generic term. That could be pathogens, that could be exotoxins, anything that's trying to cause an infection or make us sick. The opposite of immunity is susceptibility. So, susceptibility is the, the capacity um, to become infected with a pathogen, or sometimes I say infectious agent, okay? Sorry, I drew a blank there for a second. Um, so these two things are pretty much opposites. Immunity is our ability to fight off the infectious agents and pathogens, and susceptibility is our capacity to be affected. How likely is it that you are to get uh, uh, infected with some pathogen or infectious agent? They are exact opposites. If immunity is high, susceptibility is low. If immunity is low, susceptibility is high. And so if you have someone who is immunocompromised or on immunosuppressant drugs, then that raises their susceptibility for certain infectious agents and diseases, okay? Now, what we're gonna talk about is, um, I'm gonna mention both branches of our immune system, the innate, and what we call acquired immunity. And they each go by multiple names. So I'm gonna to try to give you all of those because you may see them in one book this way. We call it innate immunity. It's also called non-specific immunity. Okay? So innate immunity. First of all, it comes from the term naissance like renaissance, which means the rebirth. Naissance means birth in French. So innate nature, anytime we say nate, nascent, we're talking about birth or born. Innate immunity is inborn immunity. We are born with this immunity. Um, there's a certain categories of white blood cells that we're gonna talk about in a few minutes. And one of the things I want you to realize is that some of the cells are already in our bloodstream when we're born, okay? Um, that is the exact opposite of what we call acquired immunity. Now, 
So innate means inborn immunity, okay? You're born with it. You're born with these white blood cells. Now, um, one thing to know about these white blood cells is that they will attack any general invader. It can be bacteria, viruses, toxins, fungi, parasites, doesn't matter. Anything that tries to invade your body, these cells, if they, if they recognize a foreign invader, we call these foreign invaders or foreign cells because they're not natural to our body. Whenever a foreign cell enters the body, or sometimes even a foreign protein, like an exotoxin, then um, these white blood cells will recognize it and phagocytose it or remove it one way or another. They don't care what it is. They don't need to know who it is. They just know it doesn't belong. Okay? So they will remove it. So we say they attack any general invader. Okay? That's why we call it nonspecific. They're not looking for it, whether it's a virus and that specific virus or this particular bacterium. They just know this cell is not belong, does not belong to my body and they wipe it out. So a few details about the innate immune system, okay? Um, it is always available to us, meaning you're born with it from the time we're born until we die, unless you have some kind of disease or disorder of the immune system, it's available to us. It provides a rapid response. As soon as the white blood cells recognize a foreign invader, they go into action and attack it and set off a whole series of reactions to try to help fight off this infectious agent. Um, and there's what we say, no memory component. Because they can attack any general cell, they don't need to remember who this is. If it doesn't belong, they wipe it out. Um, imagine if you had a, a, a party, um, say for uh, a, a particular group of people, maybe your football team at the end of a season, and everybody that's wearing your jersey is on your team, and it's required that you have to wear the jersey or the hat for the team in order to be there. If someone comes in with a different jersey, you don't care what team it is. You don't care if you're wearing purple jerseys. You don't care if they're red, blue, green. It doesn't matter. If it's not your jersey, they get kicked out and removed. That's general uh, immunity. Um, you don't have to, to know or care what team they're from. If they're not on your team, they don't belong. We get them out. That's the general immune system, what we call innate immunity or nonspecific immunity. Okay? So there's no memory component. You don't even have to remember, hey, a guy in a yellow jersey tried to get in. If the next person who comes in is wearing a different jersey, you remove them. And that's kind of how these cells work. Now, we're going to talk about the opposite of innate immunity. I just have to make some room here. We're going to talk about what's called acquired immunity. Acquired immunity is also called specific immunity. It is also called adaptive immunity. It goes by all three names, okay? Now, a couple of things. You are not born with this immunity. Let me see how close I am writing to the edges of the screen here. You have to forgive me, it's just me and a video camera. I'm gonna move my camera just a little bit. All right, so you're not born with this immunity. It only develops after exposure to a pathogen or toxin of some sort. So, that's why it's called acquired immunity. You only get it if you're exposed to a specific pathogen. 
It's also why it's called specific because it is it provides immunity to a specific invader. Okay? That specific invader would be an infectious agent, a specific bacterium, a virus, a toxin. Um, you're not born with this, but we do have some cells that are sitting in our body called lymphocytes, a, spe a specific class of white blood cell that are kind of, if, they're, if they've never been exposed to anything, they're sitting there just waiting to be notified what to do. When they encounter a specific invader, they don't attack it. They sit there and try to figure out, what is this? This doesn't belong to us, but what is it? Um, and then they can develop proteins called antibodies that will bind to that specific invader and only that specific invader. Hence the term specific immunity. It's also called adaptive immunity because our body is adapting to this new invader and we have to figure out what it is. So it's acquired only after you get exposed to the pathogen or toxin. Our body adapts by developing antibodies against it and they are against that specific invader and nothing else. So imagine if you had a party for your football team and someone shows up with a different jersey and one of your bodyguards recognizes it and for the rest of the evening they are only looking for people with yellow jerseys and the yellow only someone comes in with a red jersey this specific security guy won't recognize them he only recognizes the yellow then another security guy might step forward and be responsible for removing anyone from the red team so we have specific immunity from these cells. One's dedicated to this invader, this one's dedicated to that invader, and if a new invader came in, neither one of them would recognize it. Another immune cell would have to come and recognize it and be dedicated for that specific one. So, a couple of things. What's not inborn, we only acquire it after exposure. On initial exposure, you get a slow response. Could take a much longer than the innate immune system okay now it has a memory component what that means is once a particular lymphocyte recognizes a specific invader it will remember that invader and therefore under subsequent um, exposures you might get a much more rapid response but the initial exposure to this invader you have a slower response, okay? Um, now, the focus of this entire lecture is going to be over the innate immune system. We're gonna do a whole other lecture on acquired immunity, um, and I don't wanna go into a lot of detail in this one. Although I may mention some parts of it on occasion, we're really saving that for a whole other lecture. Now, first and foremost, um, if you have to take immunology courses, uh, I'm sorry, because you know immunology is one of those very difficult topics in, um, in biology, in the sciences. And so, um, I, I really, we could, we could spend years and years and years and years trying to understand all the details and not understand them all. It's, it's unfolding as we speak. We're learning more and more about the immune system. So I'm gonna provide a very general, basic overview of the main components okay so now when we're talking about our body's immunity one of the first things we have to talk about is what we call our first line of defense our first line of defense is essentially basically the membranes and the secretions on the surface of the body um, it would involve some um, structural components like the skin the membranes themselves it will involve some um, mechanical components the movement of fluids through the body. Um, it will involve some chemical components, the actual chemicals or secretions themselves and how they affect um, pathogens. Now, when it comes to the structural components, we're essentially talking about our skin, the cutaneous membrane, and the mucous membranes, the internal membranes. So I don't know if you remember this from AMP. I'm gonna draw something off to the side here, but here's a little person standing sideways now, 
The external surface would be our cutaneous membrane, which is essentially skin, hair, and nails, right? Now, we have some, uh, some compartments, internal passageways and compartments that are open to the outside world. For example, the respiratory tract and the oral cavity go down here to your lungs and through the digestive tract and out the other end. And then we have the reproductive and, and urinary tracts. So we have the urinary tract leading to the kidneys and the reproductive tract. So those openings, those are internal compartments or passageways that are open to the outside world. Uh, you can stick a finger in it and, <laughs> and um, they would be moist with a mucousy covering. So we call those the mucous membranes because they're covered with a slimy secretion called mucus, which is essentially some water and some protein. Now, we have some other membranes that we talked about in part one AMP. Um, we talked about synovial membranes and um, we talked about uh, the serous membranes but they're really not part of our first line of defense because this is the first thing that microbes would have to penetrate in order to actually enter the body. So um, your skin and your mucous membranes are part of your first line of defense. Those are somewhat of the structural components. Now, um, a few things about them. When we look at, uh, and essentially it's this. So if we were gonna look at the structural portion of our immune system, our first line of defense, then that would be our skin and mucous membranes, right? Or another way to think about it would be our epithelia. If you remember from anatomy and physiology, epithelium, thelia means layer and epi means outermost. Thelia really means leaves, but so the epithelia would be the outer coverings of the body. If you could reach in from the outside world and touch it, ah, ooh, here, then you're touching an epithelium, sticking your fingers in your nose, in your ears. Now, one of the things we know about epithelial cells is that the cells in any epithelium, whether it's a single layer or multiple layers, are very tightly joined together by some membrane proteins that bind them together called cell adhesion molecules. So they have very, very tight um, junctions. And really, I don't want to use the term tight junction because that is a specific type of cell adhesion molecule. But the joining of the cells, the, the gap between them is very small because they are really stuck together with some proteins called cell adhesion molecules. It makes it difficult for some bacterium or virus to try to weasel its way into our body. And um, so it helps provide some of our defense. Um, another thing that helps is that when we look at this, particularly these epithelial layers, is that the outermost layer of cells can start to die and be shed or sloughed off. As we shed those cells, if there were bacteria on the surface of those cells, then we would be shedding those bacteria, okay? So that also plays a role in, in part of our structural um, defense. So some adhesion molecules are the very, very um, tight joining of the, of the epithelial cells and the fact that we shed some epithelial cells. Um, another thing that's important to note uh, is that we also secrete a protein in our epithelium on the cutaneous membrane. We have a protein called keratin And that keratin makes our skin rather dry and water resistant. A lot of bacteria and a lot of pathogens need moisture in order to survive. Um, and so because we have very, very little water and, and moisture on the surface of our skin usually, it makes it difficult for, for some of these microbes to survive. Um, some of our cells, particularly this mucous membrane right here, and I'm going to put, use a different color, but part of our mucous membranes are ciliated. I 
shouldn't do it there. But in the trachea and part of our respiratory passages, we have cilia. And ciliated cells move substances along. So I don't know if you remember from microbiology, but some of our cells, if I were to look at two cells next to each other, or three cells, some cells have no extensions of their membrane. Some cells have very small extensions of the membrane that we call microvilli. They increase surface area for absor absorption. But some cells have these very long membranous extensions called cilia. And the cilia have protein in them that cause them to beat. And as they beat or move, they continue to push substances along. If they're moving in this direction, then they would move any dirt or debris that gets trapped in them. And actually, ciliated epithelial cells usually secrete mucus, or we have some goblet cells in here that would secrete mucus that would trap any dirt or dust or debris or pathogens, and then they move them along. Whenever something starts to tickle the membranes, we will either sneeze it out, snot it out, cough it out, hack it out somehow. <clears throat> when you do that, you're actually literally getting rid of some of the mucus from what we call the mucus escalator, uh, which is part of our ciliated cells. So that plays a major role. And then sometimes it's the secretions, and we're going to go into this in more detail. But for example, in our ears, we secrete a stuff called cerumen, a very waxy substance that any microbes might get trapped in and then our body tends to shed that. So that's all part of our um, structural components would be the epithelial surfaces, the cells themselves, with their very tight joinings with, with cell adhesion molecules that prevent bacteria and, and pathogens from penetrating. The fact that we can shed the cells and shed bacteria and, and pathogens with them. The fact that some of them have cilia to move things along and keep it going, okay? Now, I'm gonna erase this because I want to go into um, the second facet of our first line of defense. So we have sort of a structural component, the actual skin and membranes themselves, the mucous membranes. Um, we also have what we call the biological component. The biological component, biology meaning living things, the biological component would be our microbiome, or what we call the microbiota our normal flora. And as you know, those normal flora do a number of things to prevent infectious agents or pathogens from uh, penetrating the body. So some of these internal passageways have some bacteria that are there, um, some normal flora. And one of the things that those bacteria can do is they make that environment inhospitable to GPS pathogens. signal lost. For example, lactobacillus and part of our gut and the urinary tract of the vagina or not the urinary tract, but the vagina, can make it very acidic. A lot of microbes don't grow very well in an acidic environment. So um, the microbiota can, can make a certain area of the body very inhospitable or not very good for bacterial growth for pathogens to um, reside there under normal conditions. Also, um, there's a thing called microbial inhibition or microbial competition. In microbial competition, one of the things that can happen is the normal flora, the microbiome, those cells are consuming all the nutrients. Since they completely overtake the area, they would outcompete any pathogen for nutrients and other things. That's why we talked about super infections when someone takes some kind of antibiotic and knocks the, the level of normal flora down, then you become more susceptible to certain pathogens growing in those parts of the body. Um, now, there is somewhat of a mechanical component, and to me that mechanical component involves what we call the mucus escalator. Okay? And we just talked about this. In the respiratory tract, in the trachea and part of the nasal passageways, we have the pseudostratified ciliated columnar cells that have these cilia that are beating, and <clears throat> as we produce mucus, the mucus is actually forced to move up and away from the respiratory tract, protecting our lungs from a lot of dirt and debris and from pathogens. And so that would be our mechanical component, is we, we have this little group of cells that are beating and pushing snot up 
and that snot should have could have uh, infectious agents trapped in it, and then our body sheds that. Um, and then there's a chemical component. Secretions and other chemicals in those secretions. For example, sweat is very salty. Okay, there's a lot of salt. It is hypertonic. Many microbes cannot withstand a very hypertonic environment. So sometimes our sweat helps prevent the invasion of the body um, by making our skin very hypertonic. We have stuff like lysozyme in tears, sweat, and saliva. Lysozyme is an enzyme that lyses certain um, bacteria. It messes with the cell wall of bacteria and can uh, have a bactericidal effect. And so that would be another chemical component. The, the, the chemical lysozyme, the molecule of lysozyme, which is secreted. Um, also, um, acid in the stomach. Stomach acid has a pH of somewhere between 1.0 to 2.0. It's extremely acidic. That's very inhospitable for many, many microbes. Um, they, don't, they don't do well in the stomach. So some of our secretions um, will, will make the environment not very hospitable or prevent the growth of bacteria in those areas based on making it hypertonic, causing cells to crenate, so to speak, poking holes in cells or lysing them, or just preventing their growth due to the acidic environment. You know, acid will denature proteins. So, um, one other thing that I, two other things I wanna mention, although I'm not gonna go into them in great detail. Bile in the digestive tract is extremely salty and it's, it, it also makes parts of our digestive tract inhospitable and hypertonic. Um, also, some of the fatty acids and the oils secreted in our skin create, make, create somewhat of an acidic environment. And again, a lot of bacteria and pathogens don't like acidity. Um, now, so our first line of defense really involves the structural component, the actual skin and mucous membranes, and it's very difficult for pathogens to cross because of those junctions and the shedding and sloughing and the cilia moving things along. The biological component would be the microbiome or microbiota, which outcompete other bacteria and other pathogens for, for um, nutrients, and also can make secretions like acids and enzymes that are, make the environment inhospitable. The mechanical component is the mucus escalator. It's literally moving stuff along, trying to get it out. Also peristalsis in the digestive tract. And then there's the chemical components, sweat, um, the acidity, the saltiness, the hypertonicity, acidity. We also have acid in the urethra. The vagina is somewhat acidic. That makes it not nowhere, nowhere near as acidic as this, but it makes it inhospitable for certain bacteria and helps prevent things like urinary tract infections and yeast infections under normal conditions. And then certain enzymes that are in those chemicals. Now, when we get to the actual innate immune system itself, we're gonna be talking about our second line of defense. What if something actually gets into the body? So, let's say you get a cut, you step on a nail, or you cut your hand, you uh, bump into something and it scratches your back and it breaks the skin. Now we have com compromised the first line of defense, and now some microbes might get into the body this way. So then we have to activate the second line of defense. And the second line of defense is the innate immune system. In order to understand the innate immune system, we have to talk about certain white blood cells. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about blood itself. So when we talk about our blood, what we mean is whole blood. Whole blood is made up of two components. There's a stuff called serum plus deformed elements. Now serum is 
uh, well, not serum, it's plasma plus the formed elements. Plasma contains serum, and within plasma, there's a whole bunch of chemical components that are dissolved in it that can play a role in our immunity to things. But what we're gonna focus on right now is the formed elements. The formed elements include what we call RBCs, or red blood cells. What we learned in AMP are called erythrocytes. Now that's not part of your immune system. Red blood cells simply carry the dissolved gases or help with the removal and delivery of dissolved gases from the tissues. But what we're really worried about is the WBCs or white blood cells, okay? Now the technical term for our white blood cells is leukocytes. And I'm gonna tell you this, leukocyte can be spelled with a C or a K in this first position. So. Uh, the old German spelling would be with the K. A lot of this was figured out by um, scientists that spoke German. Um, and leukocytes with, with a C is the more Americanized and common version. So leukocytes are our white blood cells. These are our immune cells. The third component of formed elements is the platelets. Platelets are involved in clotting. We're not concerned with platelets right now. We're not concerned with, right, with red blood cells. We're gonna focus on the leukocytes or the white blood cells. So now, let me erase this, and we're gonna go into the white blood cells. We'll talk more about plasma and other things later on. So, when it comes to the white blood cells, they are divided into two major categories. One category, is called the granulocytes. Under microscopic observation without a whole lot of special technique, these have some cytoplasmic granules. So when we look at these cells under a microscope, we can see little greens inside of them. They didn't know under initial observation what they were. Of course, there would be a nucleus in there. So they call them granulocytes. They contain cytoplasmic granules on observation. The second major class is called the agranulocytes. That means they do not have cytoplasmic granules. And actually they do, but they're not very visible under normal micro microscopic conditions, okay? So for the granulocytes, there are three subtypes of granulocytes that we need to know about, okay? One is called the neutrophils. Now, if we were to look at neutrophils under a microscope, if we have a typical red blood cell, I'm gonna draw a little red blood cell here. This is the size of my red blood cell. Then a neutrophil usually stains with a light blue background, and they're a little bit bigger than red blood cells. One of the things we know about neutrophils is that they can have a multi-lobed nucleus their nucleus can take on different shapes. So a typical cell in the human body usually has a round nucleus, like we saw when we looked at epithelial tissues in AMP. But these cells, their nucleus can have a large lobe, and then another lobe, and then another one, and sometimes they can be branched. They take on all these weird shapes. They do have some cytoplasmic granules, but they don't really pick up either one of these dyes that is very, um, very pronounced in color as far as the background. So, a few things about neutrophils. Number one, neutrophils are phagocytic. So, when a neutrophil encounters a foreign thingy, let's say a foreign invader, like some kind of bacterium, that neutrophil can actually take that foreign cell, the invader, into a vesicle. It can phagocytose it and then it will fuse that vesicle with a lysosome that has some enzymes that can digest it. So, um, one of the things we know about neutrophils is that they are phagocytic. Also, neutrophils are the most numerous of our white blood cells. They make up about 70% of the white blood cells of the body are neutrophils. Um, they take on a neutral dye, that's why they're called neutrophils. Um, one of the things we know about neutrophils is that in, in, in addition to being phagocytic, they can release compounds called prostaglandins. OK? 
Okay. Now, one of the things we know about prostaglandins is that prostaglandins can increase um, inflammation. They can make blood vessels dilate, and they result in what we call inflammation. So, when you think about a flame, fire, what do you think? You think redness. When we think of this, we think swelling and heat. That swelling is called edema. Essentially, what prostaglandins can do is they can dilate blood vessels and make them a little bit more leaky so that some of the fluid leaks out into the surrounding tissue. And as the tissue fills up with fluid, it becomes swollen. So that's one of the major effects of the uh, prostaglandins, okay? Um, also, there's another class of compounds that they release. They can release these things called leukotrienes, okay? Leukotrienes are chemicals that attract other white blood cells to the site. So when a neutrophil encounters some pathogen or infectious agent, it can phagocytose it. It doesn't care what it is, it just knows it doesn't belong and it consumes it. And basically what they're doing is they're recognizing what we call surface antigens, proteins on the surface of the cell. And your own cells have surface antigens that are recognized by our white blood cells. And when those white blood cells <clears throat> recognize a foreign antigen, one that they're not used to seeing, they immediately engulf it or phagocytose it. Now, in addition, they can release compounds called prostaglandins. So if there's a nearby blood vessel, that blood vessel will dilate, and as it dilates, sort of the, the, the little joinings between the capillary endothelial cells become strained, and more stuff can leak out in between those cells, and we can get some edema, some redness, and some swelling. In addition to the prostaglandins, they also re release chemicals called leukotrienes. And those leukotrienes, as they are released, will cause other white blood cells to come in and also start to try to pop out of our bloodstream. And once they do, as they pop out, they will also try to attack the infectious agent. So, really what it is is somewhat of an alert system. Number one, it causes swelling and redness and heat. That increased heat, like fever or temperature, is um, damaging to some microbes. It slows their uh, ability to reproduce and can kill them. Fever is good, low-grade fevers are good, so a little warmth means that there's something there and that our body is responding. The redness and swelling is also an indication. That inflammation is an indication of an immune response. Um, now the leukotrienes will also cause other white blood cells that are cruising through your bloodstream to pop out into that area. Um, it's sort of like uh, if you know where the bad guys are and you could throw a smoke bomb there and that way the rest of your military can come attack them, it kind of tells everyone where the bad guys are. And that's what leukotrienes do. They attract the other white blood cells to the site. And they say, here guys, this is where the fight is, okay? So that's what's notable about neutrophils. It's kind of basic, but that's all I want you to know. They're the most numerous white blood cells. They are phagocytic. They can release two compounds, um, prostaglandins, which increase inflammation, increase permeability of blood vessels, and leukotrienes, which attract other white blood cells to the infectious site, okay? I'm gonna erase some of this information because I need to go over the remainder of our um, white blood cells, okay? Now, another class of the white blood cells that is considered granulocytes would be cells called eosinophils. Uh, I guess I could put ABC, I might be confusing. Eosinophils. The fill at the end of the name means to love, and they love this dye called eosin. They pick up a stain called eosin, which happens to be a reddish stain and an acidic dye. So when we look at these cells, their cytoplasm usually stains somewhat of the same color, a light blue color. One of the things we know about these guys is that they tend to have a bilobed nucleus. 
Their nucleus has two lobes to it. And they fill up with these very bright red granules. They have little vesicles inside of them that seem to absorb this red stain called eosin. Now, a few things about eosinophils. Number one is they're not very abundant. There's a lot more neutrophils, okay? Um, and a second thing that we know about them is that they can increase in number or they respond to um, antibody labeled bacteria and parasites. For some reason, eosinophils are very sensitive to parasitic infections and can massively increase in number due to parasitic infections. Um, now, they are phagocytic. Now, without going into too much detail, one of the things I said is that they phagocytose antibody-labeled bacteria and parasites, and that's true. So, what happens is this. Uh, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about these cells, but I need to mention them briefly here. We have part of our um, acquired immune system. Here, this marker is not very strong. From our acquired immune system, or what we call adaptive immunity, okay, if I could write. We have these cells called lymphocytes. Now, lymphocytes are rather small compared to a red blood cell. So if this would be the size of a neutrophil and eosinophil, lymphocytes are smaller than red blood cells, and lymphocytes are almost entirely nucleus, like the whole cell is very little cytoplasm and a lot of nucleus. One of the things we know about lymphocytes is they have the ability to secrete what we call antibodies. Proteins. that bind to surface antigens from foreign cells. So if an invader came into the body, I have some foreign cell, it's going to have certain proteins in its outer membranes, part of the, the lipid bilayer or the membranes of cells. When a lymphocyte encounters this guy, he'll start to, he really sort of kind of thinks about it, and it's not really thinking, but they have the ability to rearrange some of their DNA in the gene to make these proteins that will actually stick to that specific invader. And the proteins that can bind to that are these little Y-shaped looking proteins called antibodies. And the antibodies will stick to these foreign cells and then, when I have an antibody-labeled invader, and it's got little antibodies all over it, then eosinophils can come in and start to engulf it and phagocytose it. Okay? So they tend to phagocytose antibody-labeled bacteria and parasites. The antibodies come from our acquired immune system, and we're going to go into that into more detail later. But suffice it to say that lymphocytes are not phagocytic. Usually they don't actually kill um, the foreign invaders under normal conditions. Most lymphocytes, there's a variation on the theme here. But they can secrete proteins that will bind the foreign cells and help our other immune cells recognize those foreign cells. Another unique thing, but well, we'll get into antibodies later on. I don't want to go off on that tangent. We could be here all day talking about it, and it's really cool stuff. I can't wait to get to it. Okay, so now, um, let's see, is, there, is that everything I wanted to cover on eosinophils? Let me make sure I, uh, ah, really key, key thing, they can secrete what we call cytotoxic enzymes. So not only can they like, can they phagocytose foreign invaders, especially antibody labeled ones, but let's say we have another foreign cell that gets in here. Eosinophils can release enzymes. And those enzymes can poke holes in these foreign cells 
and be toxic to them and kill them. Okay? So now we have two of our three subtypes of granulocytes. Neutrophils, the most numerous, multi-lobed nucleus, and they are phagocytic and can release prostaglandins and leukotrienes. Prostaglandins increase inflammation. Leukotrienes attract other white blood cells to the infectious site, including eosinophils as well. Eosinophils will increase in number when we have um, antibody-labeled bacteria or parasites. Whenever there's a parasitic infection or in bacterial infections, they will increase in number. They also increase in number due to certain allergies. There's a type of asthma that is an eosinophilic asthma where the eosinophils um, uh, release chemicals and it becomes very damaging to the respiratory tract. We're not going to talk about that, but you may encounter that at some point in your training. So eosinophils will increase in number when there's bacterial infections and parasitic infections. And they will engulf or phagocytose antibody-labeled bacteria and they can secrete cytotoxic enzymes, enzymes that help lice open the foreign invader. Okay. Now, let me uh, erase some of this information, and I'm going to go into our third of the three um, granulocytes, which is called basophils. Basophils love this basic dye, and that basic dye gives them some very dark blue granules. So they're about the same size as neutrophils and eosinophils. They can have a multi-lobed nucleus. But one of the things we know about them is that they have these dark granules. They're almost a deep bluish purplish color. I don't have my purple marker on me, so this one will suffice. Okay? Basophils are even fewer in number than eosinophils. So a few things we know about basophils. Um, one of the things we know is that they play, they play a role in acute allergic reactions. They provide what we call an acute alert allergy response. So if you breathe in some tree pollen, you wake up in the morning, and if you start sneezing and, and snotting and your eyes are watering like crazy, that would be called an acute allergic response or acute allergy response. It's rapid onset. So some people, I have it really badly. I live in South Texas and I'm, you know, a lot of the tree molds that we breathe in trigger my immune system and I sneeze and snot about, you know, like crazy um, in the mornings. I sneeze about 40 times in the morning. My eyes water and then I get over it. So um, basophils play a role in the uh, acute uh, allergy response. One of the reasons they do so is that they can release a couple of chemicals. They release a stuff called histamine. So you always hear commercials about antihistamines, which histamine is what helps trigger this allergy response. Histamine is a vasodilator. It can cause inflammation. It causes an inflammatory response. Again, blood vessels dilate, they become more leaky and fluid leaks into the surrounding area, which becomes swollen and more red. Um, so, uh, and it will increase blood flow into the wound. They also release a stuff called heparin. Heparin is an anticoagulant. Let me make sure I'm still writing on the board. I'm getting very close to the, to the thing that tells me, ah, oh, no, I'm still on there. Heparin is an anticoagulant. So to coagulate means to clot. So heparin prevents clotting so that we can get flushing of the tissue and get some real swelling going on and keep the blood vessel dilated for a while so that other white blood cells can make it to the wound. Excuse me. <clears throat> take a quick drink. My, my throat is getting dry. Um, both histamine and heparin in this capacity allow other white blood cells to make it into the wound so that we have this massive flood. It's kind of like um, when a police officer encounters someone and they call over the radio, all the police cars in town start heading to that location if it's a bad uh, situation. And so um, leukotrienes can attract other white blood cells and then histamine and heparin also make it easier for those white blood cells to get there. By the way, 
Um, before I go much further, um, I need to talk about, well, I'll talk about this in, in just a little bit. Um, so these are the three major players for the granulocytes. Um, neutrophils, neutrophils are phagocytic. They also release prostaglandins um, and leukotrienes. Eosinophils, they can release cytotoxic enzymes and they can be phag phagocytic. They respond really highly to parasitic infections and they can phagocytose antibody labeled bacteria and um, parasites. And basophils, which can release histamine and heparin. Basophils can also be phagocytic. So all three of these guys are capable of phagocytosis, simply engulfing foreign invaders. For the agranulocytes, one of the major players is a cell called a monocyte. And I'm gonna put the term macrophage next to it because monocytes and macrophages are essentially the same cell. Most of our white blood cells live inside of our bloodstream and usually don't exit. So neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils usually stay inside the blood vessels as do monocytes. By the way, a couple of things about monocytes. They are the largest of the white blood cells by size. They are huge. So if I'm looking at these other guys, compared to a red blood cell, I have neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils, which are all slightly larger than red blood cells. Monocytes are really big, and a monocyte will always have this massively U-shaped uh, nucleus. They have a very large U-shaped nucleus or C-shaped nucleus, okay? Um, they are highly phagocytic. They encounter something that they don't recognize, they go into action and gobble it up, okay? Now, as long as the monocyte lives in the white blood, um, lives in our bloodstream, it's still called a monocyte, okay? But monocytes have the capability of squeezing between the junctions of some of our blood um, vessels, the, the, the epithelial cells, or I should say endothelial cells of capillaries, and they can literally squeeze themselves between those little gaps and pop out into peripheral tissues. So a macrophage is a monocyte in peripheral tissue. And we call them tissue macrophages. So if the monocyte is still trapped in the bloodstream, we call it a monocyte. If they live in the peripheral tissues, we call them tissue macrophages. And it turns out there's a whole bunch of tissue macrophages we learned about an AMP. Let me make sure I'm not writing off of the board. Yeah, I'm still on it, good. Um, we learned about osteoclasts, they're a type of macrophage, uh, microglial cells in the nervous system, um, there's some cells called Kupfer cells in the liver. There's mesangial cells um, uh, associated with our kidneys. Um, and uh, well, there's a few others, uh, some in our lungs. So they are very highly phagocytic. Tissue macrophage is just a monocyte that lives in a peripheral tissue. Um, now, uh, anything else I want to tell you about them? Well, the process by which they pop out of the bloodstream is a process called diapedesis. Okay. Ped means foot to move, and di means, or, well, diapedesis is the ability of a white blood cell to migrate out of the bloodstream by squeezing in between the junctions of our endothelial cells and popping out into peripheral tissues. And all of these guys are capable of diapedesis. That's how they get out of the bloodstream into an infectious site. Now, as they're fighting the infection, sometimes the white blood cells die. And as they're being killed in large number, we see a pocket of this yellow looking stuff called pus. And that's a whole bunch of white blood cells that are accumulating a bunch of dead white blood cells. Um, now, one of the things I wanna tell you is these four cells, Neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, and monocytes make up what we call the innate immune system. These guys are there when we're born, they're already in our bloodstream, and if any foreign invader comes in, they are all capable of phagocytosing it. There's some special details about these that you should know as well. 
There is a fifth class of white blood cell. It belongs to the agranulocytes, and we call them lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are the smallest white blood cell in size. And again, you can see neutrophil, eosinophil, basophil are all slightly larger than a red blood cell. Lymphocytes are not, they're pretty small. And then of course, macrophages and monocytes are huge. Lymphocytes are almost entirely nucleus, and they are part of what we call the specific immune system. I call it specific immunity. It can be called acquired immunity. It can also be called adaptive immunity. They are part of that immune system for the most part. Now, there's three types of lymphocytes that we're going to focus on. There's B lymphocytes. We're going to talk about those later. There are T lymphocytes. And then there's another class that we call NK cells. And NK stands for natural killer cells. Okay? So the natural killer cells go with these others as part of our innate immunity. Although, um, it doesn't appear that we may be born with them, but as they develop, they have the ability to be somewhat general in their response. The B and T lymphocytes make up our specific immune system. Now, um, one of the things we know about lymphocytes is they have the ability to secrete antibodies. When they encounter a foreign invader, they can release a protein that has an area that will bind to that specific invader and only that invader. Um, and so they're part of the specific immune system. Natural killer cells do not release antibodies. That's something unique about them being a lymphocyte. Now, natural killer, killer cells, rather than releasing antibodies, they secrete chemicals called perforins. So let me, let me just reiterate one last thing here. And um, These guys are part of our um, specific immune system or acquired immunity. These other four plus natural killer cells are part of our innate immune system. Okay? Although that some people debate that, but nonetheless, because they are a lymphocyte, but nonetheless. I'm going to erase a lot of this information. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, lymphocytes themselves. Actually, I'm going to save some of that for later. I'm not going to talk about B and T lymphocytes other than we know they can secrete specific antibodies against specific invaders. I want to talk a little bit about natural killer cells. Okay. They are a class of lymphocyte. But what makes them unique is that they do not release antibodies against a specific invader. Okay. They can secrete these things called perforins. To perforate means to poke holes in something. And perforins are enzymes, they are proteins, that poke holes in foreign cells. They're similar to the cytotoxic toxic enzymes of eosinophils, but they are their own class of compounds that are now called perforins. Now, um, a few things that I want to know in addition to that. Uh, well, that's what I want you to know about them. I'm going to stop there, otherwise we'll go down a rabbit hole. Okay. So, <clears throat> your innate immune system, your second line of defense, involves five cells. Four of them, or three of them, are granulocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. We have monocytes, and we have natural killer cells, which are a type of lymphocyte. But what's unique is that they do not release antibodies. They release these compounds called perforins, which will kill um, or lice open foreign invaders. Okay? They are not phagocytic. They do not phagocytose their foreign, the foreign cells. Okay? There's a whole bunch more information that might be in the, the notes. If you were in my class and you print the notes, 
You'll see me talk about all the different lymphocytes, but I'm going to reserve that for another lecture. So, a uh, few things we need to talk about before we wrap all this stuff up. Let me see what our time is like right now. Wow, we're at an hour. Okay. A um, few things I want to wrap up. Number one, phagocytic white blood cells have to move to the, to the site of an infection. Are all white blood cells do? Now, if I have a foreign invader here, some foreign cell, as it multiplies and increases in number and consumes some of the nutrients, including sometimes the nutrients of our own cells and kills them, they will release compounds. They're waste molecules. Sometimes these compounds are exotoxins, um, which we've talked about before. Now, as they're releasing it, these compounds, by the laws of diffusion, will start to spread out. And the further away we go from the wound, the more diffuse or spread out that compound becomes. And let's say um, I have an immune cell cruising along and it detects this compound, it will start moving in the direction of the concentration gradient and follows the concentration. Kind of like if you came home and you, you smell something funny in your apartment, you think maybe there's, um, I don't know, something just smells atrocious. You might go down the hallway and if it gets stronger, you continue to go down that hallway. But if it, the smell gets weaker, you back up to where you smell it and then you go down another hallway. You're following your nose you're following the chemical concentration gradient. We call that process chemotaxis. And chemotaxis is the movement of a white blood cell along a chemical concentration gradient. We also mentioned diapedesis a minute ago, which is how they pop out of the blood vessels and into peripheral tissues. So when it comes to phagocytes responding, there's sort of um, three steps to the response. If we simplify it, there's three major steps. The first, or three phases, to the phagocytic response. That first step is chemotaxis, movement along the concentration gradient. The second step is gonna be what we call adherence. To adhere to something means that you stick to it. And so when a white blood cell gets close to one of these guys, let me erase the chemotaxic part, okay? Always on the surface of some cell, foreign or our own cells, there are different proteins in the membrane. These surface antigens can take on specific shapes, so to speak, okay? And it really doesn't work this way exactly, but it's somewhat this way, okay? Um, when a white blood cell encounters this, the white blood cell can recognize and bind to specific proteins on the surface. They can adhere or stick to the foreign invader, and therefore the white blood cell can then begin to engulf it, take it into a, a cytoplasmic vesicle, or release chemicals while it holds on to it that will digest it like the eosinophils can do, okay? So um, one of the things that helps during adherence, part of this process is a thing called opsonization, okay? And opsonins are compounds, they're proteins, that bind to surface antigens, and they're not antibodies, though, to aid in recognition by leukocytes. It helps leukocytes identify the cell and stick to it. So sometimes we have these compounds that will stick here called opsonins, and the binding of these opsonins to these cells is called opsonization, and that might help another white blood cell recognize this cell and engulf it, okay? So, we call that process adherence, but it involves opsonization, the coating of the foreign cell with some proteins um, that uh, 
help other white blood cells recognize this as a foreign cell um, and uh, aid in phagocytosing them. And finally, there's ingestion. The last step of the whole process is called ingestion. I'm going to write this over here. And just like you know, when you ingest food, you take it in. That's literally where they take the cell in. So in the first step, they use chemotaxis to find the foreign um, cell, the cell that's secreting the chemical concentration gradient. Then they use adherence, very often opsonization, binding proteins to the surface of this so that white blood cells can recognize it. Once recognizing it, then they actually take that in. They take in these foreign cells into a vesicle and engulf them. Now, one of the things that you should know is that our white blood cells have lots of little vesicles in them called lysosomes. Lysosomes have enzymes that can digest things. They're called lytic enzymes. And if I fuse this vesicle with a lysosome, then those enzymes would start to digest the foreign invader and kill it. So it's a little bit more complicated than what I told you, but I want you to know these three phases of the phagocytic response. Chemotaxis, movement along the concentration gradient to the location um, where the foreign invader is. Adherence, which is binding to the surface of the foreign invader. Um, very often involves opsonization. The use of opsonins, proteins that help um, white blood cells recognize the foreign invader. And then ingestion, where they engulf the foreign invader and then we could talk about digestion and release because they break it down and release the chemical com components. Something we're gonna talk about maybe when we do um, acquired immunity is we might talk about the major histocompatibility complex and the presentation of antigens. And it's very complicated, <coughs> excuse me, and I don't know if I'm gonna go there yet. Um, one other thing I want to talk about, uh, I did mention fever earlier. Part of our inflammatory response is um, fever. Fever is an increase in temperature in the body. There are low-grade fevers, like when you're sitting around 100, 100.3, 100.4. And then there's high-grade fevers, like when you're at 102, 103, 104. Low-grade fevers are helpful in the sense that they create an environment, a hot environment, that a lot of bacteria and pathogens cannot tolerate. So um, it inhibits the growth of some microbes. Uh, fever can increase our heart rate and therefore our blood flow to tissues so that we can um, get white blood cells to the sites. Uh, it causes uh, lymphocytes, part of our specific immune system, it will cause those cells to proliferate or increase in number big time. Um, and it, heat will also speed up chemical reactions. So it will, um, speed up the binding of certain things and these chemical reactions that are required for things like adherence and opsonization. All right. Um, now, high-grade fevers are dangerous because they can denature the body's proteins. We've talked about denaturization of proteins and making enzymes inactive earlier in the semester. But low-grade fevers, things that are around 100 degrees, not super high, um, have this impact, this, this positive effect in that they um, decrease microproliferation, they increase uh, proliferation of our lymphocytes, our specific immune cells, they can increase blood flow to a tissue um, and increase heart rate. Now, um, a couple of other things I want to talk about. There are some chemicals called interferons. I'm trying to finish this up without going too long, but man, it really is hard to do any part of immunity without talking for weeks. The immune system is so vast, there's so much information, but I want to talk about a couple of compounds that are used by our immune cells. There's a class of compounds called interferons because they interfere with um, the ability of microbes to proliferate or reproduce. So um, when we have a viral infected cell, so let's say I have a cell here that some virus is bound to and inserted its genome and started to take over this host cell, increasing viral replication. 
one of the things that happens is that interferons are released by a viral infected cell. So this cell that's infected with the virus can release compounds called interferons. They are released by viral infected cells. Okay. Um, once a cell is inv infected with the virus and releases uh, uh, releases the interferons, and, and if a virus particularly inf uh, affects a, a macrophage, then macrophages can really dump a lot of interferons. Um, one of the things that happens is that they, they can diffuse to neighboring cells and bind to them and disrupt or interfere with the virus's ability to bind, or, but to bind to the new cell. So as you know, viruses, as they cruise around, can bind to certain proteins on the surface of the cell and then inject their DNA. The interferons can mess with that. They will go, be, they will be released by a viral infected cell. The interferons can bind to these receptors sometimes on the surface of healthy cells and that will prevent our virus from coming and binding to it and infecting the new cell. It sort of sets off a warning to, to healthy cells that, hey, there's a virus around and we're gonna stick to you and we're gonna protect you or interfere with the virus's ability to bind to you and therefore reproduce or proliferate, make more of the virus. Um, uh, they really do interfere with viral, the viral replication process. Finally, one of the last things I wanna mention is what we call the complement system, okay? So interferons are released by viral infected cells. They bind to healthy cells and can interfere with viral replication. There's another group of proteins called the complement system. It's over 30 proteins. That set off a cascade of enzyme reactions. It's like a chain reaction. One complement causes uh, an interaction with another complement protein. That complement protein can split and interact with and activate other complement proteins. And complement with an E. To complement means to go along with. Now, one of the things that we know that complement, um, the complement system does is it can um, increase the intensity of allergic and immune responses. They go along with an immune response and they can amplify it or enhance it, okay? Um, uh, one of the things that we know that they do is that uh, when antibodies have bound to the cell membrane of a foreign invader, um, the complement proteins can recognize this and set off this cascade of events which will enhance the entire immune response, inflammation and other things. Um, one of the things we talk about when we say the cascade for the complement system, one of the acronyms is COLA. COLA means chemotaxis. So it will increase chemotaxis because the complement system will attract other white blood cells in. It enhances opsonization, the coating of, of um, pathogens uh, with proteins called opsonins, which will help other white blood cells recognize them. Um, then there's lysis. So we have chemotaxis, opsonization, and lysis, so that other white blood cells, when they do bind to the opsonins and an opsonin coated or opsonized um, foreign invader, they can lyse that cell with cytotoxic enzymes and other things. Um, also, some of the complement proteins themselves can lyse open the bacteria. One of the things that's really cool about this um, complement system, without trying to go into too much detail, is that 
when we have one complement molecule gets activated, then it can activate others in a series of chain reactions. And we get all these other complement proteins activated. Some of the complement proteins can group together and make little channels or pores and insert into the membrane of a pathogen and cause it to leak. Um, allow, allow things, well, basically, they allow fluids to seep in and cause them to burst by, by um, taking on too much fluid. And that's a really, I mean, it's a really cool chemical reaction and setup and system that's been discovered um, not too long ago. And these little um, pores that are created are a congregation of some of these complement proteins. It's a very complex series of chemical reactions. You can look it up and it's very confusing. You gotta know complement one, complement two, complement four, C2A, C2B, all these different um, interactions. It's, it's a very complicated process. But suffice to say is that they can increase the intensity of an allergic or immune response. And they can create little pores that lice open microbes and foreign invaders. Um, and finally, the A is for activation of inflammation. They can activate the inflammatory response. So the complement system sets off this thing called COLA. Chemotaxis, they increase chemotaxis to the site. Opsonization, they, they play a role in opsonizing foreign invaders so our white blood cells can recognize them. They can create some little pores that causes the white blood and the foreign invader to lice and they can activate the inflammatory response. Now, when we talk about inflammation, some of the parts of inflammation include, and we talked about this at the beginning, vasodilation. As blood vessels dilate in a particular tissue, that increases blood flow to that tissue. It also increases the leakiness of the blood vessel, and so some of that fluid will seep out into the wound or the infection area and increase the amount of fluid there swelling the tissue. So vasodilation, increased size of blood vessels, increases blood flow, which increases the fluid in the tissue, which causes edema or swelling. Um, it will also uh, increase the heat because fluids absorb uh, heat very well and our blood is normal than um, our average body temperature. It's slightly above body temperature. 100.4 degrees is the temperature of blood, 98.6, 98.7 is our body temperature. And so it will increase warmth in the tissue, providing some fever or warmth to the tissue. As we said earlier, that um, affects the microbes' ability to proliferate or, or divide and increases blood flow. Um, you need to know the molecules that are involved in this inflammatory response which would, and vasodilation, which would be the histamines from basophils and prostaglandins from neutrophils. Okay? Um, And I think that's about all I want to talk about. We could go into tissue repair and healing, um, but I don't even want to go into that. So uh, I think this should provide a, a rather basic, decent overview of our um, uh, uh, innate immune system or nonspecific immunity. You need to know the first line of defense, which is our skin and mucous membranes and the details covered therein. The, the joining of the cells prevents microbes from penetrating the body sloughing off and loss of tissue, um, the cilia, the mucus escalator, the secretions, salt makes it uh, hypertonic, uh, acid can prevent some bacteria from growing like in the stomach, um, and uh, lysozyme and tears and saliva and sweat can lice open some bacteria. The second line of defense are all these white blood cells that we just talked about. You need to know the five major players, um, neutrophils, basophils, eosinophils, monocytes, macrophages, and the natural killer cells. Just the details that I've covered. You need to know a little bit about interferons um, and the complement system. And um, there's one other thing I wanted to mention. Um, I did not talk about interleukins, or did I? I think I did. Interleukins, yes I did. I talked about it. So no interleukins, what their function and role is, no interferons, what their role is, no the complement system, what I just talked about. All right, listen, I always get hurried at the end of these videos and get very sidetracked because I'm trying to finish in a certain amount of time. I apologize for going on so long. I really need to get these down into a very nice, neat setup. Uh, so pardon me for rambling uh, near the end, but 
Um, I'm not happy with the, with the videos overall. I wish they were a little bit cleaner and more concise, but we are under duress, so please forgive me. Anyway, I do hope that you learned something. I do hope that uh, you had as much fun as I did, and I hope to see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.